I wanted to do something useful with my life and uh, be able to look back on it later and think, well, you know, I didn't really waste my talents. Um, I could have been working for the government uh, or I could have been working for like encryption people because I'm good at math. But um, then I think looking back on it, I would have said, what was the point of that? Uh, it seemed like a reasonable thing to do. Uh, doctors do okay, you know, I wouldn't have to worry about where to get money to feed my kids. I could raise a family, I could have a reasonable amount of vacation time, hopefully. I was kind of wrong about that one, but um, it seemed like a good idea. The path to becoming a doctor is an arduous one. After completing a regular four-year bachelor's degree, the up-and-coming doctor must follow up with four years of medical school to earn a medical degree. To apply for medical school, he must complete all pre-med requirements and have taken the medical college admission test, more commonly known as the MCAT. Similar to the college admission process, medical schools look for students with interest and motivation in health and education with strong extracurricular activities and time management abilities. Top medical schools include Harvard University and the University of Pennsylvania. After being admitted into medical school, students are exposed to a wide variety of topics including anatomy, physiology, histology, and biochemistry. The typical medical school focuses on a combination of lectures and problem-based learning situations. Imagine sitting in a class, listening to lectures, and taking notes, followed with Scantron tests. This is pretty much how medical school is structured. For many students, medical school is also where everything comes together. All the seemingly unrelated concepts make sense. After medical school, the budding doctor needs a one-year internship followed by three years of residency training. Aside from the training, there are exams that must be passed as well. To be board certified, the internist needs to pass an oral and written examination. He must also pass the three steps of USMLE, which is the United States Medical Licensing Examination, as well as any state license tests. Well, you guys remember grade school still. And then you remember going to middle school, and it was probably a step up a little bit harder. And then now that you're in high school, high school is probably a little harder than middle school. And college, you go to a reasonable college, college is a little harder than high school. And then you go to medical school, and the workload doesn't require any more brains, it's just there's a lot more of it. Um, so in that sense, it's a lot harder than, than college because it requires a lot more time and dedication. For uh, gas. <laughs> His job is to leave here and die. Your job is to listen to every word I say at all times, and here's the hard part, actually do those things. Oh no, I'm not uh, familiar with the concept of sarcasm. No sweat it, it's new. Starting salaries for an anesthesiologist range from $100,000 to $200,000. The average salary is around $300,000. Anesthesiologists typically work at hospitals, medical centers, dental offices, pain management clinics, and surgical centers. Um, actually, my daily routine starts the night beforehand. When I look at the schedule and I figure out who's going to do what the following day, who's going to do what cases, and um, if any of the cases that I'm doing or any of the other guys are doing require uh, a little bit of preoperative workup, then I make sure that happens. Then the morning of surgery, I get up and get my butt into the operating room area, um, usually about half an hour before surgery starts. Sometimes surgery doesn't start until 7.45, sometimes surgery starts at 7. Um, so I might be getting to work at 6.30, sometimes 6.15 if I've got a surgeon who shows up 15 minutes early and I have a lot of work to do before starting the case. Um, I say hi to the patient. Um, I get a good idea of exactly what's wrong with this patient, what sort of diseases they have, what, uh, what things I can get away with anesthesia-wise and what I can't. Um, I discuss with them various options for how a case could be done uh, anesthesia-wise and what that means to them, how they're going to feel afterwards, what the risks are and the benefits. Um, then if I've decided to do a block on the patient and they agree, if I've decided to say numb an arm for an arm surgery or numb a shoulder for a shoulder surgery, or numb a knee for an ACL repair or something like that, and then I get going on that block if I'm going to do it beforehand. Um, 
I check on my room, I make sure that the machine's in working condition, I make sure I've got a good oxygen supply and access to suction, and uh, I load up all my drugs into syringes that I plan to use, uh, make sure the nurses are ready, make sure the bed's locked. There's a lot of silly little things that you think, well, you know, the guy's a doctor, he shouldn't be doing that, but if, if the nurse forgets to check that the bed's locked, and I don't bother because, heck, I'm a doctor, then, you know, you push a gurney, you know, one of those wheeled carts up to the bed with the patient in it, and you ask them, you lock that thing, and you ask them to scoot over to the bed, and they scoot over and fall on the floor, everybody's in trouble and the patient's hurt. So you have to take care of the little things, too. Um, so once I'm sure the room's ready, the nurses are ready, the scrubs are ready, get the patient, once the surgeon's available, get the patient into the room, um, put on the appropriate monitors, um, give them a little oxygen, get them off to sleep if I'm planning on it, or just sedate them if I'm not. Um, we do the surgery. I wake the patient up. We take them out to the recovery room. I watch them for a few minutes to make sure they're tucked in and doing well and stable and everything's good. Um, then I go say hi to the next patient. And uh, I keep doing that until all the patients are taken care of for the day. The facility's doing well. Nothing bad has happened. And... Um, then I check on the surgery schedule for the next day if I haven't already. Uh, if I got some time for lunch in there, that's great. If I didn't, well, I didn't. Sometimes I just grab a bite between cases because there isn't time. Um, sometimes I sit through an eight-hour case and then there isn't time. Um, I check on the patients for the next day then I go home. If anything interesting happens in the meantime, overnight, if they want to change a case or a cancel case, they call me and we change things. It starts again the next morning. My favorite parts are when I get to do a case on someone who needs it done and they appreciate the fact that I'm doing it and it works out just perfectly and they're happy. That's pretty cool. Um, my least favorite parts are the administrative headaches involved, um, taking care of the scheduling stuff, uh, discussing with surgeons why they can't have everything they want done exactly the way they want it for a given case. Um, trying to persuade other anesthesiologists to do what I think they ought to be doing that day. Um, taking care of the odds and ends, the administrative headache, that's the worst part, absolutely. Attention to detail. You, you can't let anything go by, you just kind of let it slide, because if you let one or two things slide, and someone else lets something slide, then there's three bad things that's gonna, gonna happen and you didn't necessarily prepare for all of them and then you could end up with a dead patient or a bad injury or a really bad outcome. Uh, you, you can't let things slide at all. Um, everything has to be exactly the way you want it. You have to, have be, you have to be pretty smart because you have to think of every bad thing that could possibly happen and then make sure it doesn't happen. Um, you have to be willing to get up early. I don't like getting up early, but it really helps to be willing to get up early. Uh, you have to keep up on, you have to be willing to keep up on, you know, the field of anesthesia. It's the same with any medical profession. You really need to keep up on it because things change. Technology changes. Uh, there's advances in drugs. There's advances in methods. Um, new diseases are identified here and there. Um, and how that changes your field, you have to know about it. You have to be able to talk to people. Uh, it's okay if you start out sort of shy before medical school because going through medical school will make you less shy and going through your training makes you even less shy. And by the time you're done, I think pretty much anybody's capable of walking up to a person they've never met before and asking them all kinds of weird personal questions and then figuring out what to do with the information. Mm -hmm.